Welcome back to the Home Inspection Whisperer Show. Today is actually a good day. We finally get to do the podcast, but this is like podcast round two. Yes. Because the first one didn't work out. I was recording and a bunch of static came through and I was going to force y'all to listen to that. And then I was like, nah, no, I'm not going to do a mediocre. Yeah, it sounded like we we're on an old ham radio or something. Yeah, it was, it was bad. It was, it was like, bad. It was, it was bad. I was like, I thought I tested it before, but yeah, it didn't work out. So um, today's schedule for the podcast, what we want to talk about is we want to answer some YouTube questions first. So if you ever have any like home inspection questions, make sure that you drop them into the comment section and give us a like button on the YouTube channel because or a positive review on podcast because we can answer your questions. That was a very... That was terrible. That was really bad. <laughs> but anyways, so what I'm yeah. trying to say is drop your questions in the comment section and Josh and I will answer them. Uh, I didn't introduce Josh either. Yeah, Josh is going to be now our new co-host and he's going to help uh, create podcasts. I was having trouble getting guests to show up at period points in time. So Josh and I are going to do this together and he is now going to be the new permanent Home Inspection Whisperer co-host. So Nice. So tell them a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, thanks for having me. I, I've never done a podcast before, so this is a fun new experience for me. I've uh, been with the company almost four years now. Uh, March will be the start of my fifth year. And uh, before I became a home inspector and came to action, I taught junior high for 10 years. Uh, that's why I have so much gray hair at such a young <laughs> age um, and almost no hair uh, nowadays. <laughs> and so, yeah, and so I was with the company for... Uh, almost three years and then they promoted me to lead inspector and we'll talk a little about the training program that I'm doing right now in just a little bit uh, but yeah happy to be here all right so I did I cover all the topics already I, I don't think I did you said we're going to answer some questions okay so but kinda, I didn't cover the full then you kind of went yeah the, the, the like ADD, all, yeah, the ADD the kicked in yeah. <laughs> okay yeah so we're going to answer some YouTube questions first and then we're going to someone asked in the home inspection a whisper Facebook group, what, how to transition from a solo man operator into a multi-inspector firm. And I thought that was a really good question because that was actually a very hard transition for me. And so we wanted to talk about our training program today. And I thought that it perfectly tied in together to actually cr come into a multi-inspector firm from a solo man operation. You really need a, a really good training mm -hmm. program. And we have slowly adapted it. And I think our newest one, it, it worked the first time. Let's see if it works the second time. Yeah, yeah. We'll, see. <laughs> yeah. we'll see, hopefully. And um, so we're going to go to how to train an employee. And then we did have a complaint recently. We're going to kind of talk about how this complaint actually is our fault and how we decided to handle it. And, uh, you know, and I've started reading this book about how uh, it's called about thinking bets. And it's about, you know, how to handle your decision making, even though it's not always the decision doesn't always work out doesn't mean that it was a bad decision. So I thought that was a really cool inner, maybe small podcast. If we could fit all that into one podcast. Yeah, I'd be super impressed. We need some more coffee. <laughs> yeah, so we can talk faster. Yeah. Okay. So starting off, the very first question that we had was actually from one of our, I think our second most recent YouTube video where you, uh, we had some kick out flashing, not properly installed on the side of this two story house. Mm -hmm. And we found some moisture in the wall. And the funny thing is, is we actually missed that moisture the first pass mm -hmm. of the house and we found it on the second pass. So my first pass of whenever I'm walking through a home, I'm always looking up. And then the second pass, I'm always looking down and Josh found it on the second pass. Actually the third pass with the infrared camera. Yeah. It was with the thermal we saw. The yeah. Board. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. So we even missed it kind of, cause it's like in a dark corner of the home, but the, the moisture, yeah. the infrared camera picked it up, which was, you know, that's why we have all the steps that we've created over a period of time. Mm -hmm. And he, the question pretty much asks, like, are we required to diagnose where the moisture is, or are we just supposed to document facts? Hey, there's moisture there, have it further evaluated. Mm -hmm. And my opinion on this is what I try to do is I try to find out as much information as possible. So the question is, is like, what if it's not raining, but you still have moisture down there? Would you have still said it was like kick out flashing or something like that? And I, and I probably would have said, yes, kick out flashing, but you're not required to diagnose it. So I could say the way I would say it's probably the kick out flashing, but I'd still recommend to further evaluate it because you still had high soil sprinkler spraying on the wall there and you had poor kick out flashing at the top. And 
the moisture could be resting at the bottom, not draining through the whole wall. So to answer the question is you're not required to diagnose exactly where the moisture is coming from, because the only way to do that is to rip open the wall. Like you have to rip open the wall and then you can really figure out where the moisture is coming from. So I just, the way you want to document it is to say, you know, heavy moisture with your tools, you know, the infrared pictures, and then say, have it further evaluated You buy a technician and let the technician figure it out. You mm-hmm. know, what do you got? Yeah. And I, I agree with that. And I think it's really important, you know, if you're trying to give the client options for what could be the source of the problem, you also need to make sure you tell them that, you know, I can't open up walls as a home inspector. So you're not going to know for sure what is going on uh, until you do open up walls. Yeah. So that goes into what I verbally say. And then what I write down is two different things. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I'm not saying the source of the moisture is from the kick out flashing in my inspection report. I'm yeah. verbally saying, Hey, that's a possibility. You know, this is also a possibility, but in my inspection report, I write, you know, about moisture elevation in so-and-so room, you know, uh, this is the percentage level and have it further evaluated and corrected as necessary. You know, something super simple to the point. Yeah. So, yeah, you never want to, you know, pontificate in your report. It should just be facts. So, like that report, you know, we had the thermal camera photo showing the blue, and then we also backed it up with the moisture meter, which I think it was maxed out yeah. on the moisture meter. And so the just comment was, you know, elevated moisture was found in the walls. I think it was in the dining room. And then our comment just says, further evaluation and correction is is recommended. Yeah, super easy. So always keep it super simple to the point, document the facts, and then whatever you say at the inspection is, you know, it's not, it doesn't mean anything. And and, and the only thing that matters is what's in writing. Yeah. So that was uh, question number one. Uh, Question number two, we had um, someone is uh, really eager to get into this in Michigan. And his question was, is like, how long should he shadow uh, before he gets in the field on his own? And uh, uh, I'll take the lead on this one. And this one actually hits some of our previous podcasts. And the po- and to answer that question, I would say, you if you are ever you do find someone and whoever you're shadowing, make sure you let them know your intentions right away. Be like, hey, I want to get in this. I want to be a solo man operator. You know, and because what's happening is is this person is training you on to be their local competition Mm -hmm. more than likely you know sometimes you can agree to some sort of compensation plan where he you could pay to teach him how to be a home inspector but you don't want to just shadow people and then turn around and be like open up shop and you're like your next door neighbor (laughs) you know that's it's kind of messed up so you want to make sure that you let them know or if you want to go work for a multi-inspector firm make sure you let them know be like hey I do want to eventually become my own solo man operator. And there is a lot of multi-inspector firms that are completely okay with it, but there's some that just, you know, we are trying to grow like an empire and create a really good workspace for everybody. And if you have a high turnover rate, you can't do that. So you want to make sure those intentions are d- said right at the beginning. Mm-hmm. To answer your question, I'd say a hundred homes. You know, I figured out that anywhere between 60 to 100, it depends on what the inspector, I would say, depending on your construction background. I'd say right at 100 homes, it like clicks and you know enough to be dangerous, I would say. And um, how many, I don't know how many reports you should write. I'd say at least a minimum of like 50 of those 100 homes produce full reports for you to be a good home inspector, I would say. What What do you got? Yeah, I would say that's a good number. And then also what I would do, and this is what I did on the side when I was training with uh, Chris when I first started with the company is, you know, I would train with him during the day. And on the weekend, when I wasn't physically at jobs with him, I'd go home and practice on my own house and just try and put into practice what I saw because myself, and I'm sure most people out there, learn by doing. And so I would practice on my house. I'd practice on my neighbor's house. I'd practice on my parents' house. Like anybody that would let me come and, you know, tinker with their house And I think that really not only uh, reinforces what you're observing, you know, following your mentor around, but then you're also figuring out things for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, that's how I learn is everything. I have to like, I'm very tactile, tactile learner. And if I'm, you could tell me what to do every day, but until I like physically do it, it's not going to work. Yeah. All right. So the next one was, is uh, we had an inspector in the Facebook group. He asked um, how 
to transition from a solo man operator into, you know, hiring your first employee and then letting that first employee do an inspection without you there, you know, how to transition into a multi-inspector field or how to get out of the field. And honestly, that was really hard for me whenever I first started. I don't think I even got out of the field field truly until like six years in to the business. You know, the first five years I was still doing like 400 jobs a year while trying to grow this business and set it up correctly. And it wasn't even until like really last year where I was out of the field. And so that might even have been six years. So, and it all fell back into training programs. And that's what we really wanted to talk about today was like training programs, having a really good training program, a set path for the person that you chose to work with your company so they can learn to follow it correctly, easily. And, uh, my old training program, I wouldn't say it was, it worked, it worked, (laughs) but it wasn't, it wasn't pretty, Yeah, you know, and it was, it was like a three month process before they even started making money for the company. You know, we let the company pay them like $500 a week, which isn't very much. They are learning a new trade, but it's only 500 bucks a week. And that ends up being a pretty big burden on, your inspection company, especially if you're a solo man operator, that's $2,000 a month minimum without the payroll taxes that you have to pay out before you even, you know, and that happens what three months. So you're out $10,000 almost in just training Mm -hmm. just before the company even starts making money. So it was pretty tough. So, but with this new training program that Josh helped create and he'd set the platform for it, they start making money and start paying for themselves after six weeks, mm. they start getting landing jobs and it kind of mitigates the training pay a little bit. Uh, so the first step is, is you want to have a really good training program and talking about the training program, the very first thing they do whenever they walk into the property or they come to the office is we start handing them everything. And I'll let you talk about that. I think you'll be a little bit more clear okay. about what we hand them. Yeah, no. Um, so we decide on a six week uh, program and I kind of sat down and penciled everything out and how we wanted to work through our inspection routine, how we do the inspections here at A Action. And I looked and I said, you know, I could really, if I got one on one time with these guys, uh, at least half the day, I can get them through our full inspection routine in about four weeks. And that would give us about two weeks for them to every day practice doing the full inspection by themselves. And I'm just following them around. I'm not even really talking to them at that point. Um, is making notes and then they can talk with the clients as well so that when they transition into the field that first day when they're in the field on their own they're not that's not the first day they're doing an inspection by themselves but back to to day one of the six week uh program is we bring them into the office and we give them their basic tool set and that includes uh their tool pouch with uh two screwdrivers uh water gauge uh water pressure gauge um outlet testers and a volt sniffer and then uh, we also give them their tablet, keyboard, mouse, and a camera. Um, and so they're really set up to do a very basic inspection from day one. Yeah, with no specialty tools. You know, that's actually yeah. what I'd say 90% of home inspectors even walk around with. They don't carry zip levels, you know, infrared cameras, drones. They don't carry any of that. So Yeah, yeah, it, we, yeah we don't give them any of the big tools until about week four when we feel like okay they're they're kind of getting it and they're, they're they might actually make it yeah might yeah, yeah. The, the make it point we're like okay now we'll spend a little they're, bit they're still money. inspector maybe in your yeah, phone inspect- <laughs> actually that's actually kind of funny that it brings up anyone that joins the company and they make it through the interview process it, it'll be josh inspector maybe yeah. and so i don't fully commit that you're an inspector yet yeah. until you <laughs> graduate and then it's then it's like josh inspector a action yeah. in my phone <laughs> yeah because yeah, then that happened like you're in the field once and then you saw me look up your number and it said josh inspector maybe and you're like oh my god yeah. does this guy <laughs> yeah like i had sent you a picture or something and you're, you're looking up and then like, it's yeah and so i was like oh i i'm not, I'm not that good yet <laughs> <laughs> he was like Maybe is it? Am I like an inspector? In the- yeah. Well, I was kind of worried. I was like, am I not going to make it with y'all? Like, I, do I need to go <laughs> apply somewhere else? Uh, yeah, it kind of made my my yeah mouth pucker a little bit. <laughs> so <laughs> that's um, funny. Anyway, so yeah, we don't give them you know the the thermal camera, the drone, the zip level, uh, the big items until about week four. Um, but we sit down, we give them their their basic setup on day one. 
And the first thing I do is I show them how to operate our software, um, how to open up a new report, create a new report, and just like the basic ins and outs, how to find comments, uh, how to find your different sections, how to put in comments into the template, and how to add photos. Um, which with the old training program, it was kind of about four weeks of, you know, you just kind of, kind of follow us around and you figure it out as you go Yeah. instead of being like, Hey, this is how you do it. Yeah. yeah. And then we would throw the tablet at them about a month in and it's kind of like starting over from square one. Um, and so I thought giving the tablet day one, show them how to operate stuff. Then they can take that information, go home and, and learn it on their own, uh, beyond what I teach them during the day. And so we spent about an hour and a half going through the program, operating it, how to, how to run through it. And then I show them the kitchen, which is where we start our inspections. And we go through the entire process of, of how to inspect the kitchen, how to document it with photos. And then at the end of that, they write up a mini report with just the, basically the kitchen sink, kitchen appliances, and anything we see on the walls and ceilings, floors there. So I know that sounds like a lot, but that's actually just the first half day. So they like mm -hmm. walk in, they get all their tools, and then he shows them the software, the basics of the software, then they start in the kitchen like almost immediately. And then that's just the first half day. And mm -hmm. to kind of go back into like you're a solo man inspector and you're transitioning in the field and you want to be a multi-inspector firm, this is like something where I think that you should actually take a half day. If you want to train someone, you're going to sit down with them instead of just throwing them in the field, throwing them in the weeds right away, sit down with them one-on-one -on -one and be like, hey, this is what we do. Mm -hmm. You know, this is how we do it. And then, and then you make sure that you go to that second job scheduled and you let them practice that in the field. I'll let you go to the second half. That didn't make sense 100%, but no, it fine. will in a second. Yeah, it and will so in a second. to tag along with that, you know, especially if it's a new person that you're trying to train, you really don't want to overwhelm them right at first. Like, all right, here's a full inspection. Go home and write the report with my software. Um, because you know, especially if it's a brand new person, they're fresh out of school, and yeah, school teaches you, you know, basic yeah. information, how to pass the test. But at least in my experience, where I really learned how to become a good inspector is doing it every day in the field. Uh, you learn so much more that way than reading something in a book. Um, and so that's why I went with, you know, we're going to start with a small chunk of here's how you do the kitchen. And that only takes us, you know, 15, 20 minutes to teach them that. And then we have enough time that first half of the day they can practice twice. Yeah, they, yeah. Well, two or three times with our, our last guy that's in the field. Now we, we were able to do like four or five times that first day. Mm -hmm. And so from day one, I mean, he can get through a kitchen and, and catch most everything that, that we do as, as seasoned in inspectors. Yeah. So like, yeah, nine o'clock you show up, get your tools, introduce the software, run through the kitchen four times, you know, then you even have a, like a small lunch break and then boom, you're in the field the first day and you're like, all right, do the kitchen, yeah. you know, and you, he's writing it on your report and he sits down there and you just step back and you just let him do his thing. And then who finds everything, he puts it in. And then after that, Josh takes his, takes over and then he can watch the first pass of the property. So, you know, it, it, it's introduced in phases, but uh, I think that it's been like the best introduction to mm -hmm. getting someone understanding like all the back ends of home inspecting. Yeah. Almost immediately. Yeah. yeah. And that's our current schedules. I, I take the morning block and that's when I'm working one-on-one -on -one with the trainee. And then the afternoon I'm doing my own inspections and whatever I've taught them that morning is immediately reinforced that same day of like, okay, we're at my inspection now, but you're going to take my tablet that I'm writing the report on and you're going to do what I've taught you. Right. So day one, that afternoon, they've done the kitchen. And so at the point they finished their six weeks of training, they've been doing kitchens from day one. And then once I feel it's kind of like a step-by-step -step process, once I feel like, you know, they're comfortable and they can kind of move around the kitchen and look like they know what they're doing, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, that like, well, what do I turn on next? Um, right. and once I feel comfortable with that, and usually it's like day two, uh, they're fine because the kitchen is not, you know, overwhelming. Then yeah. we start on the first pass and we just kind of progressively walk, uh, work our way through the entire inspection routine. And if you want to know our inspection routine, we actually have a full YouTube video of that. And my father and I, we went through like our basic routine process of how to enter a room, how we knock out the kitchen, how we knock out a bathroom and the process of us following the inspection. You can check that out further in the YouTube channel. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it, that is, I pulled, you know, my 10 years of teaching. One of the biggest things I learned as a teacher to help students learn quickly is you follow a three-step, like I do it, 
we do it together and then you do it. Yeah. Um, and that, so that's kind of what I follow with working the trainees through the uh, inspection process is I'll do it once, we'll do it together, and I talk you through it, and then you do it. And then we'll go back, and if you know they do something wrong, then we'll go back and like, hey, let's try it again. Here's what you know we need to fix for this time. And so it's a constant like they're doing it alongside me, and I'm just you know reinforcing what they should be doing if they miss anything or they you know do something out of the wrong order. Right, and I mean, and this goes. I'll kind of go back to like someone that is a solo man operator looking to become a multi inspector firm. This really comes into make sure that you take you know, one day off half day in the morning and you sit down one-on-one with that person and you introduce the new phase of what you want him to do. And I think that's where I failed a lot because you're in the grind, you're in the hustle. You don't want to say no, you know, you have 10 jobs, but really you losing that four or $500 job that one morning, you increase that person's knowledge and that one-on-one so much more than just constantly throwing them in the weeds, you know, clear up anything that they don't know. And you know, sit down and really work out all those problems. Yeah. And I think that's where I failed the most. Whenever I first started training people, it'd be three months of them in the weeds, just figuring out and me throwing knowledge at them. Be like, all right, go home, write a report, go home, write a report. And now it's done in phases and it's broken down. And I think that's, I think that's really good. Yeah. Yeah. We've been able to cut it. I mean, it'd take you, like you said, three months and we've cut it down to six weeks, but then at the, the end of that six weeks, they've done so many, full inspections through the training process and, and with me there helping them that day one of they're in their field on their own, they're on like their 30th inspection that they can do the full thing themselves. Yeah, so they did it by themselves. Yeah, yeah. They, they have more information. They're more confident uh, doing the inspection and more confident talking to the clients. And that falls in right in the line that I teach everyone coming in. You, you know, you don't get the dough unless you put on the show. Mm-hmm. And if you're not putting on the show and you don't look, you, you're looking around and you don't look like you know what you're doing, even though you kind of do, but you look like you don't know what you're doing, you're not going to get paid. You yeah. know, you're not going to get referred out. So, um, yeah. So make sure you know what you, you know, fake it till you make it or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> make, make sure you know what you, what you're doing. Oh yeah. I like I said, that's, that's, I just stand there and watch them operate through the kitchen appliances and they look like they turn around three times. Like, what do I turn on next? Like, yeah. all right, you've turned the kitchen sink on. Like, go to the dishwasher it's usually yeah. right next to the sink and so yeah once they a... can move through the kitchen and it's like they know to do this and then this and there's no pause or hesitation like okay you look like you know what you're yeah, doing. you look like you know what you're doing so like if you're a fir- new home inspector and you're getting in the field and you know your clients are watching you and this is about like comfortability with them and they're sitting there and you're sitting there like you're turning on the sink and you're just sitting there watching the sink they're, they're gonna be like What's yeah. this, what's this guy doing? Yeah. You know, like <laughs> <laughs> my favorite with the new trainees is, you know, we, we, we plug up the sinks to put a load of water in there to run the disposal and they start running the disposal and they forgot to <laughs> unplug the sink. And so oh, like, yeah. you got to pull the drain, man. <laughs> <laughs> you got to, you got to water load the disposal. Yeah. No, mine is always, it's funny. Uh, new inspectors, what they're always doing, no matter what, you can always tell a new home inspector is they walk around with their flashlight on the entire time. Oh yeah. That just bothers me. I don't know why. It's like my pet PM. I'm like, you know, I tell them every time. I'm like, they're like, yeah, my battery keeps dying. Yeah, because you have it on like a thousand lumens walking through the house the entire time. How is your hand not melting yet? Yeah. <laughs> just turn it off. Yeah. You know, it's like it's not pitch black, but you know, you use it to find the water stains in yeah. the on the the ceiling, but they just leave it on the entire time. I'm like, come on, chill out, chill yeah. out. Yeah, it's that's funny. So, uh, small commercial break uh, to help grow the, uh, the channel. We actually have a, uh, we actually have a store on home IW.com and the comments and the, the, what Josh is talking about in the software, we actually sell all of them. And Josh just recently, uh, made them look really clean and neat and separated them in each file. So, you know, foundation comments, if you just need foundation comments, you can open up the PDF, double click in that file and all of the foundation comments are fully separated out, and we uh, we charge three forty nine for all the comments. But there is t- over two thousand. I'd say there's almost three thousand mm-hmm. comments of just basic home inspection comments, uh, written very well and to the point to where the people will know where to go and which technicians to call uh, for the for your software. It's, it combines with Home Inspection Whisper, uh, I meant the Home Inspection Whisper, Whisper Reporter software. We can send you all the files so you can uh, do that. And we have a basic Spectora template, but um, uh, it's mainly built for Texas. 
And you, but if you want to use it for any other software, you have to put it in one by one. But honestly, I still think it's 100% worth doing it one by one because it you get to really know the comments and understand what each one says. Yep. And those comments are for the the standard inspection. And I'm currently working through the the pre pour and the pre drywall oh, inspection yeah. comments. Those are as well. good. So I actually those come out soon. I had two people ask for those. Yeah, we yeah. have pre pour and pre drywall comments already written and. Uh, and those 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 are pretty good. We do we're slowly adding more and more onto those, but I still say there's still over a thousand of those comments. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just it's, it's just like every time we go out there, we find something new and we update the comments. And then if you do purchase the comments, what we always do is anytime that we update them, we actually email them back out to uh, you if you purchased them in the past, uh, helping out the the home inspection whisper podcast. So that's kind of nice. And uh, the final one is we always like to give out a shout out to ACC. If you do uh, sign up with ACC, make sure that you drop the Home Inspection Whisperer name. They actually waive your startup costs. So it, normally it's like a $200 or $300 startup cost, and that's wiped out. So you don't have to pay that uh, signing up. And then I think that's it. So also just make sure that you always sign up for the uh, the YouTube channel, hit subscribe and the like button, and then always join our Home Inspection Whisperer Facebook group that that helps drive traction and drop your questions in there so we know what you want to hear on the podcast. Um, all right, so the training process. We'll go back mm-hmm. to the training process. So day one, uh, they're in there. You know, they have the basic setup. And then, so, so when do you think they start the training process of like doing the full interior by themselves. Are you trying to get that done by like week two or week three? Uh, actually it's probably day three or four. Oh really? First week. Yeah. Um, and so our, our guys start on a Wednesday, um, just for payroll purposes. And so, you know, by the end of that first week, my goal is to at least very roughly get them through, uh, the first interior pass. And I tell them that weekend, you know, if you have time, I know it's, you know, family time or, or whatever you need to do. But if you have time on the weekend, what really pushes you through training faster is going and practicing on your own home. And so, you know, like I said, by the end of day three, they should have a, just a rough idea of doing the kitchen in the first pass. And then what I do along the way is at each segment, I make them take all their photos that they want to take, put in the comments in the uh, software, and then they write, like I said, a mini report. Um, and so day one, it's just the kitchen. Day two is the kitchen, and they might get a few of the first pass. But uh, at least by the end of the first week, they can do the kitchen, the entire first pass, hopefully finding most everything like we do, and then they're writing the report. So every single day, they're putting in comments in the software, they're starting the the report themselves, they're putting in comments, and they're putting in photos. Yeah, I think that is really good. You know, a lot of home inspectors, the very first thing I always recognize is, like, whenever they're asking me questions, they're always writing reports, like, two to three hours after their full day of inspection. Mm-hmm. And by doing it this way, we teach our inspectors, like, how to write them on site. Yeah. Uh, and that, I think, like, when it, and a lot of people are like, oh, I don't write that in site. You miss stuff. But I actually think it's the other way around. Mm-hmm. You know, you take that stuff home. You've seen two homes. How are you not going to combine that in your head? You know, when we're done and we go through our whole routine, our whole process and our whole report writing, I, I think it's very rare that I miss something really big because yeah. like what happens is, is like there's sometimes I'm writing the report on site. I'm like, man, I forgot to turn on the furnace. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know why, but it just happened and it's, it's blank in my report. Yeah. So I don't have to drive back out to you know, Richmond and it will be fine. And that's where all of our guys here alter a little bit is they follow the routine the same way, but some guys will do the first pass, take all their photos, stop in the kitchen, put all the comments in. Uh, I myself, I carry the tablet with me on the first pass. So my first pass is a little bit slower, but as soon as I see, you know, water stain on the ceiling in the dining room, I stop, I take my photo before I even start walking in, it's in the report with location. Um, and so I don't, you know, that's just how I do it. Um, and that's one of the things I also tell the trainees is, you know, the very beginning of training, you need to figure out what you're more comfortable with. Are you more comfortable carrying the tablet with you and documenting as you go? Or do, would you rather document with photos and then come back to the kitchen and write it at the end? Um, but yeah, back to my point of like, they're writing at least a portion of the report every single day, because what I saw before is when we gave them the tablet, that's what really slowed them down is, you know, they could get through the inspection process, but then finding all the comments and knowing how to put in photos, I mean, it would, it would take, them, them, yeah. Yeah, take them three hours to write a report. Um, and so by starting on day one with 
how to operate the software and then, you know, uploading comments and photos, it, we were really able yeah. to. What I've noticed is like by the time they're done with that training program, about the week six, it takes them about an hour and 20 minutes to write a report. Mm -hmm. So we block them off four hour time periods where they can actually complete a full inspection and then they'll have a, you know, a rough draft of the report written and then they can show the client the rough draft and then they can go home and finish the report that way. Yeah. That's what I've noticed. Yeah. And one other thing I do is I, I print them their six week schedule and email or email it to them. Uh, I don't print it anymore, uh, but they get an email PDF copy of where they should be when throughout the training process. They can see, okay, week three, I should be at least going through the exterior pass, but I haven't gotten out of the kitchen yet. I'm pretty far behind. I bet we could put that on the home IW page for like 10 bucks. Yeah. Sure. All right. right. We're going to do that. We're yeah. going to put that on the home IW page for 10 bucks. If you want Josh's, um, Josh's schedule of like how he, our training path, you can purchase that there and that will help out the, uh, the podcast a bit because cool. these mics aren't cheap. I don't know how much they were, but I, I remember them not being, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not, not being the, the cheapest. All right. So I want to move into the next uh, part of this, uh, this podcast where I was recommended this book and it's called thinking bets. And it's about like decision making. And we always base our decision making on results. And it kind of goes like, what is a bet? And it's, a, it's, a, it's always a decision based on an uncertain future. So uh, we always make a decision, but then we always base, was it a good decision or not on the actual result? whenever we didn't think back on like, well, why did I make that decision? Mm -hmm. And so the decision doesn't determine if it's good or not based on the result you could still make a good decision and the result was bad. It just turns out that the result ended up bad. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was um, a really interesting, that just spoke out to me right away because, you know, as a action, whenever I first got a complaint, I would make a very reactive decision. I would start, I would come at them and I'd be like, that's not our fault. You know, this is, this, you know, this is the reason why what happened and people don't respond to that really well, you know, and what I've noticed is, is like a action whenever somebody comes at us with something, I always uh, let them explain what their side of the story, which I got that from never split the difference. I just let them talk. And then whenever they're done telling their side of the story, I'll, I mean, they could talk to me for like 30 minutes, you know, I'll just let them talk. And then after that, most of the time people just want to vent, you know, that is also part of never split the difference too. They're just upset. And most of the time, whenever they're explaining it to you, they'll even be like, oh, that's not your fault. Like they'll actually, it'll come out that yeah. way and be like, okay, well, I understand that you're upset. You know, you're frustrated. This is the reason why this could have possibly happened. And then they, then they kind of go from there, you know, and so the very first thing about this book, it's about not being reactive in your decision making. And what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make is, is anytime someone comes to me about a problem with our home inspections or anything like that, it's a very long process of decision making. And let's try to wrap this all around once. So like, for example, you know, just recently we had a termite complaint saying that we missed a uh, dry wood termites mm -hmm. and uh, the client sent us some pictures of some dry wood frass. Well, we pulled up the report and we explained to him, we're like, all right, sir, um, you know, the home was occupied at the time. It was set up for staging. The only way to find dry wood termite for a damage is through most of the time frass because they kick out those little pellets. But a lot of people don't know what they are so they just clean them up. They're like, man, this stuff just keeps showing up and they clean them up. They don't know what dry wood frass is. And we explained it to him and he was like completely okay with that. He hired another termite company and then this dry wood frass found, was found like, I don't know, a lot, a lot of locations. It was like 11 locations throughout the property. And I'm like, okay, well, this could have possibly been our fault. So what we do instead of automatically being like, that guy's a liar, you know, mm -hmm. you know, we did an inspection. Here's some pictures. We hire our own termite inspector third party and send them out there that we guy we trust we send work to and he came back he's like yeah chris you know uh there's quite a bit of evidence around here you know this could possibly be your fault 
Well, in a action, we actually have an emergency emergency fund. You know, a lot of you guys, y'all spend twenty five dollars on inspection on some of this insurance stuff, but we just set twenty five dollars in inspection pretty much aside, anyways. And if anything like this happens, it doesn't hurt the company. It doesn't hurt, you know, the owners. It doesn't hurt the employees. It's just like, hey, this money's set aside for something that happens. And if uh, and all we did is we looked at it like, oh, it's our fault. And the guy even came to an, a reasonable agreement where we paid for a majority of it, but he didn't want us to have to pay for the hotels and the, the you know, the grading around the property and whatnot. And we, we pretty much paid it out. You know, I'd say that's a very rare occasion, you know, especially if you're a solo man operator, the chances of that happening, this is the first time it's ever happened to us in eight years. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, it's, it's like, I wasn't reactive about my decision. My decisions were at the time where I'm just like, all right, let's see what, let's see what happens. Be very, think about all the possibilities and just work through the situation instead of reactively deciding what you're going to do. Yeah. I hope that made sense. That makes sense. (laughs) Yeah. Oh yeah. It it takes the emotion out of the decision and the reaction. Yeah. So this book is a poker book, you know, you know, and Josh and I, we actually host like a, a poker game uh, at I have the poker table has a action across. If you follow us on Instagram, you can I post pictures of it every now and then. And I, it kind of reminds me of a hand, too, as well. I just recently had at pocket fives and, you know, I raise it like 20 bucks before the flop and the flop comes out and it's like perfect. If you're not a poker hand and just fast forward it just a little bit, but the, the, the flop comes out five, six, six, and you know, the pot's like $120. So I bet $120 into the pot and the person across from me jams for like four or $500. And I instantly make the call Mm -hmm. instead of just sitting there thinking about it. I'm probably going to make the call no matter what, if I look back on it. But the problem is I was, a reactive decision instead of like sitting there thinking about it, be like, man, what would they be jamming with? And the person turns over six, five. So like, I'm, I'm like dead. Yeah, they, they have like, my only out. Yeah. There's nothing you can do at that point. Yeah, There's, there's like nothing. And so the, that person practically has the second nuts to yeah. the, the hand. So the, I just, it also kind of goes back to just being like, no matter what you do, don't ever do like reactive decisions. It's just like, you know, always think about everything before, you know, all the possibilities before you, you move forward. So, um, yeah, do you have a hand that can kind of describe that situation? Uh, shoot, I don't know. Um, last game we played, I had Pocket Kings five times. That was pretty sweet. Yeah, but, they're, uh, they're, that, that those are easy decisions. <laughs> yeah, well, no, okay, so, you know, the I had Pocket Kings, uh, and I won four out of the five hands, but the one I lost, the guy next to me, uh, I'd raise, you know, like 10, 15 bucks pre-flop and he calls I'm like, all right, he's got something, something big. And then the flop comes out and it's like ace six, two, something, you know, something terrible. Like that. I'm like, great. Like he called me, he probably has an ace and he did. And so, but at that point I was pot committed and I was, you know, I was trying to bluff him out thinking like maybe he just maybe he had like pocket Queens or something. But, uh, yeah, I just kept betting into him. He just kept calling, and then he he like check raised me on the end. I was like, "Well, crap." <laughs> did, you, did you fold? I can't remember. Did you fold the check raise? Uh, no, I called him. I, yeah. I shouldn't have, but I did. But that's, I mean, that, that goes back to I was just I was reacting immediately. I, I didn't sit and think like he. In the back of my eye, I was like, he probably has the ace, but I'm just going to keep calling him in case he doesn't. Um, right. And, but like the check raise at the end, you should have thought about it, you know set, yeah. step just instead of like instant like sit there and think be like, man, yeah. Well, at that point, it was like my third or fourth pocket kings. I was pretty cocky at that point. I was like, I, just <laughs> I, got, I got this. I can't lose. Yeah. I can't yeah. lose pocket kings. Yeah. And so <laughs> I was just throwing money his way. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's that's a good example of what not to do because yeah. I was, you know, reactionary calling. Yeah. So going back to like home inspections, you know, when it comes to ma- making decisions about, you know, complaints or even home inspection fines, honestly, it, it can even go back to the beginning of the podcast where as soon as we saw that water stain in that video, we automatically were like, oh, that's the kickout flashing mm-hmm. instead of thinking about, well, well, no, there's no kickout flashing up there, but there's no damage up high. And then we started really thinking about the process right away. And then we stepped back and watched how the water was running down the wall and it was actually the gutter, you know, the Mm -hmm. gutter wasn't performing properly and it was draining water up into like the wheat poles or something like that. And so it's just like, 
you know, don't be reactive on your decision making and also pick up the book. I have not finished it. I'm very poor at finishing books, especially those <laughs> self-help books. Like I'll start reading it. I'll get like four or five chapters, chapters in. I'm like, okay, you're just repeating yourself at this yeah. point. I got it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> don't be reactive on decision making. Good. Yeah. Got it. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I think that's it for this podcast. So, uh, do you have any comments you want to say before, uh, we close it? Uh, no, no, I'll keep working on the, the, phase one phase two comments try and get those up in the store uh quickly and then uh yeah this is fun yeah this is fun i'm really glad to be back though i really enjoy doing the podcast i'm sorry i took a break the the covid uh i never caught covid but or maybe i don't i think i actually might have been patient once sometimes (laughs) because i came from the conference and i got sick but who knows but the thing is is like the whole shutdown and stuff i just wasn't mentally in the right spot and and I just didn't want to be in the not in the mental right spot and then come out and try to be like, yeah, be motivational. And, and I'm not. So, yeah. <laughs> like, no, this yeah, is- so yeah, I, I, we do plan on trying to do a podcast once a week. We have a time blocked out Friday mornings, mm-hmm. which we did have already. But then the podcast messed up and now we are we're back at it. So yeah. every Friday we'll be shooting a podcast. Make sure that you drop us those questions so we can con- keep continuing, have content to cover. Yeah, it's gonna be fun. I think the most fun part for me is sitting here watching the wheels go and see where, <laughs> which, which, which rabbit hole you're gonna go down next. See, see where, where my ADD brain takes us. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, wait, what like, were we talking about? <laughs> yeah, hold on. What point was I trying to make? Yeah. All right, cool. All right, that's it. So that's uh, Chris with A Action and the Home Inspection Whisper uh, podcast. And you have Josh, Josh Gibson, and you can follow us both on Instagram too as well. So um, Josh's Instagram isn't as cool as mine, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, actually, you had your TikTok video. Yeah. yeah. That TikTok video. He had a TikTok video that went uh, 140,000 views now. The gutter oh, the one. gutter one. Yeah. Yeah, that was, that was crazy. But that wasn't on your podcast, uh, Instagram. <laughs> no, I don't post a whole lot. I just follow. But yeah. My, yeah. All right, cool. I like my screen name on it. <laughs> what, 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 what is it again? S- Sir Gibbs a lot. Sir, Sir Gibbs a lot. <laughs> All right, we're actually ending it here. All, All right. right, catch us on the next one, guys. See ya. Bye, y'all. Bye.